Yeah, I would like to thank the organizers of this conference. I think it's a really nice conference and it's a pleasure to speak here. And we have all witnessed the great advances of machine intelligence over the last couple of years. And uh, it's really inspiring to think about and to talk about the impact that those uh, advances can have on all kinds of real world problems. So I, I want to uh, talk about some uh, development that our group ha has done and the impact that we think this will have on medicine or medical imaging in particular. And um, so uh, we at Bay Labs, we are thinking a lot about where we, uh, deep learning can be applied and where it can have a great positive impact on a large number of people. And um, we made it our mission to increase the quality and the value and the access to, to medical imaging. And um, so in this talk, I would like to talk about three things. I want to introduce this prob problem that we are trying to solve, so the problem of quality and uh, value and access uh, to medical images. And uh, then I will um, uh, show some results from the lab that make us believe that we can solve this problem now with uh, using deep learning. And then I want to share some, some early results that we had where we uh, show that uh, we can already positively impact uh, people that uh, need, need it most. So, um, so, which button here? So, um, so we think that uh, machine learning or deep learning can impact people uh, like Angelique here in, in Rwanda. So I, I will talk more about her case uh, later. So um, she lives in Rwanda and there's no access, essentially no access to medical uh, imaging and also not to the uh, experts that would interpret those medical images. And um, even though this is a very extreme case, of course, when it comes to, to access to medical imaging, we think that our mission is also very relevant here in the developed world. And we think that if we Im increase the quality and the value and the access to medical imaging, it will also have a great positive impact uh, on our healthcare system. So if, look, for example, at, uh, at access um, of medical imaging. So I think most of us probably know someone who is affected by a heart condition, maybe even someone who died from a heart condition. And unfortunately, oftentimes these conditions are detected at a very late stage when it's almost too late to do something. And oftentimes, there, for a long time, there are no symptoms of this disease. And virtually the only way to find out about it uh, is in, in these early stages is to use medical imaging. And yet the heart, for example, is, is not regularly imaged. And this, of course, has a lot to do with the cost related to, to medical images. So um, the key question that we try to solve here is how can we bring medical imaging to more people in more situations and ha have an impact then on, on their lives? And how can we do this with increased quality and also increased, increased value? And uh, as you will see, we think that deep learning can help to, to solve this problem. And we also believe that ultrasound will play a big role in, in this future. So why ultrasound? Uh, sorry. I, I hear, um, here's just uh, the point um, uh, that um, the, the cost is, is a really large problem because these healthcare costs are exploding. This, so this is the total healthcare cost that's in, in the US. It's about $8,000 per person per year, or this $2.5 trillion a year. And a sizable fraction of that is due to medical imaging. And um, we think that if you can reduce those costs, for example, then this will have a great impact also, secondary impact, because it will allow for more medical imaging and preventive medicine and early detection of diseases. So, um, so I wanted to say, so why do we think ultrasound is, is a good, why do we focus on ultrasound as a modality? So it has, uh, if you look at all the different modalities that you can use to look inside the human body, ultrasound has some very great properties. So first of all, it's safe, as opposed to, for example, x-ray it doesn't have any ionizing radiation. It's very effective, so there are lots of studies that show that it's superior to, to other forms of uh, other alternatives like the physical exam, for example, and it's very affordable. So here, the, the Moore's law is on our side, and every year, these devices become uh, lower cost and smaller. 
So I, um, this, this uh, size and portability is actually a very important aspect because this allows the doctors to take the ultrasound device and go wherever the patient is. And that can be in a hospital bed, but it can also be in an ambulance or it can be in rural Africa or somewhere. So um, yeah, I want to give you just a quick short history of, of these ultrasound devices. So this is a, a very revolutionary machine from about 30 years ago and that for the first time allowed to have this color Doppler flow visualized in real time. And before, before this machine existed, you had a machine about this size to record the ultrasound data. And then for the analysis, you need another computer that was the size of, of a whole room. And so here, putting all of this on this one card was, was a big advance, advancement. And then, of course, uh, technology moved on. And then about 10 years ago, there, there were these laptop-sized ultrasound devices. And they, they started what's called the point-of-care ultrasound revolution, uh, which is still ongoing. It's, it's very interesting. So there's some very inspiring TED Talks uh, about this that uh, I would encourage you to look at. And so the, the idea is that this machine will essentially, in the hand of a doctor, will give the doctor superpowers to look into your body and in critical situation detect and then treat critical uh, uh, conditions and essentially save lives. And then, uh, of course, the technology further improved. And then about a year, since about a year ago, we have this uh, ultrasound device that's only the size of a tablet. And together with this little probe, you can put all of this in your, the pocket of the code. And uh, it's a very high quality ultrasound image. And uh, a couple of months ago there, Philips released this device where the whole ultrasound device is essentially integrated into this probe and it just connects uh, with a standard USB uh, connector to a standard smartphone. So we were really excited about this development on the hardware side, and, but we recognized that now that we can have these ultrasound devices in our pockets, there's still the problem of how do we interpret all, this, all these images. And um, of course, this is where deep learning comes into the picture. And um, the, uh, lost my, oh yeah, okay, so let's, let's take a step back and look at how, how, what does it mean to interpret ultrasound images? How does it look like when experts do it? So this is an example of some clip and there's some uh, heart you see in the middle and um, the, these experts look at this and they immediately recognize some uh, um, anatomic uh, structures and some diagnostic information and they can just in an instance see all of these things in, in their mind, what's going on with this particular image of the heart. And the way when we watched those experts doing this uh, interpretation, that reminded us very much the speed with which they are able to do this reminded us on this task that's called uh, object recognition in a glance which is a task that's very well studied, and it's a task where deep learning performs very well. So this is an example of this object recognition, recognition in a glance. It's a psychophysical experiment. So the subject, so you are the subject now, and you, you look at the screen, and in the middle there's an object flashed, and within this very short amount of time, you have to recognize what kind of object it is and to which of these seven categories the object belongs to. And uh, it's, it's, of course, uh, di how difficult, it's pretty difficult because this object is somewhere on some cluttered background. And also difficulty, of course, depends on what distance you have on the screen. But uh, humans can perform this task in, in just about 100 milliseconds. And monkeys can perform this task. And the question is, how does the brain perform this instant recognition of, of objects? And so here's some, um, we know a lot about how the brain is, uh, is doing this, so it, it, perform, uh, it transforms the signals from the retina over LGN and these uh, cortical regions. And, um, uh, and uh, this structure or this, uh, this system is actually the inspiration for the very early deep uh, learning structures more than 50 years ago. And it has basically inspired and started this whole idea of these deep neural networks, which I think <laughs> other people mentioned, it's actually a pretty old idea already. And um, so uh, a couple of years ago, so Charles Cadieu and Hao Hong, who are both at Bay Labs now, they asked the question, how does the state-of-the-art deep learning system, how does it 
perform compared to the human brain or the monkey brain. And uh, they started this question in uh, the DiCarlo lab at MIT, and they, they recorded data from different cortical regions. So the, the blue one before and the later uh, IT, yellow IT region. And then you can plot the performance in object recognition. So I, I can't go into the details, but higher is better here, and you can see that these IT neurons, which are at the end of this hierarchy, perform much better in recognizing an object than the, the early stages in the visual system. And then they, they took um, the response from, of artificial neural networks, deep neural networks, and plotted it against, on the same scale against these models, uh, sorry, against the real neurons in, in monkey brains, and you can see it's scraping along here at the bottom at basically a performance zero. And this was only a few years ago, and then only about 2012, 2013, suddenly these neural network models uh, approached the performance of, of actual brain neurons and even outperformed it. And this is uh, where we all got very excited because essentially that means that now machines can perform tasks that previous only we thought only brains can do. And so here's, here's an article, Wired article about this. So this is uh, Charles and Ha, who are uh, with me at Bay Labs. And um, we, are very, we were very excited and we thought, okay, if these neural networks are so good in understanding objects that are around us in the world, it should be possible to take the same neural networks and train them on data inside of us and, uh, and understand what's going on inside our, our bodies. And so this is basically the idea how we think that this will unlock the potential of this pocket ultrasound because you have this device that can record the data wherever and whenever you want and you can put this, this recognition on the same device. And uh, now I just want to talk a little bit about how we think this will affect uh, people and medicine, and uh, for example, in this case of uh, Angelique in Rwanda, so um, here, her situation is she uh, has uh, suffers from rheumatic heart disease, and uh, this is a, a condition of the heart that uh, is basically, since she is in an area where she doesn't have access to medical imaging, it typically gets undetected, and then uh, children like her then typically uh, die from uh, heart failure. And um, she, in her case, she was very lucky. Uh, so Team Hart found her. She, they, they monitored her with ultrasound and diagnosed her with ultrasound and then operated uh, on, on her heart. And uh, so it was a life-saving life, life operation. But you, you, can, you can see that this uh, rheumatic heart disease is a very big problem. And here are just some facts. So there, it's a chronic condition that's caused by this uh, bacterial infection, uh, rheumatic fever. And it affects, it's, it's the most common uh, disease, acquired heart disease in children, and it affects a lot of children in the developing world. In fact, the total number of, of cases is on, uh, larger than 15 million, and uh, so there are about every other minute somebody dies from, from this heart disease. And um, so how, we, how can we, how can we have an effect on this disease? As, uh, as this is an example where we think we can have uh, a positive effect with deep learning. And so the, um, in the case of Angelique, she was able to receive an operation, but of course this is not available for all these people with rheumatic heart disease. And a lot of organizations agree that the only way to tackle this problem is to detect it earlier. In early stages, you can still treat it essentially just with antibiotics. And, um, in, and ultrasound is very effective in detecting this disease very early before you even have symptoms. However, you need not only these low-cost devices, you also need people to interpret this, this data. And there we were, we were asking, okay, can we help with deep learning to, to solve this problem? And so we are, we are still very, very early on, but uh, we were able to develop a system that can, on a portable ultrasound device, can be used to reliably detect rheumatic heart disease. And we took the system and shipped it to Rwanda and the people were using it there and trialing it and see if it can help training these local people to better detect the disease. And also we hope in the future maybe can fully automatically detect it. And as I said, the treatment is very low cost because you can in the early stages treat it with antibiotics. And so we see a path where this low cost ultrasound and deep learning together can help these local 
providers to, to tackle this disease. And as I mentioned before, this is just a showcase uh, of one disease. There, there are other diseases in the developed world where we think we can have a similar, similar impact if we detect it earlier and reliably. So this is, this is our team. We are now 10 full-time people, and we have uh, uh, lots of um, advisors. So these are the most important ones. So uh, in particular, Dr. Randy Martin is one of the pioneers in electrocardiography. And then uh, David and Alan and Kevin are uh, probably among the best uh, cardiac sonographers here on this planet. And uh, Vince is has helping us with uh, some of this um, business and product problem. And so um, if you are excited about these missions, as excited as we are and want to help us uh, in, in developing this technology, then please contact us. Thank you.